Thanks, Denise. Appreciate it. How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? Thank you. A little energy in the room. Come on. So um, let me pull out my notes. Um, the other th first thing I want to say is um, we got a great panel of uh, folks up here. I'll let them introduce themselves here in a minute. But I also wanted to just mention I wanted to thank you guys for coming to the event. Um, Denise didn't mention it, but I actually am on the board for SV Forum. I've been on the board for a number of years, so I'm really glad that you're uh, supporting the, both the, the community of folks that are interested in this kind of technology as well as the organization to continue to put on great events like this. So thank you for being here. So today, we're going to have the opportunity to talk about, you know, basically this connected space. And one of the things that I think is really interesting here is getting the different perspective, what's working, what's not, what are the challenges, um, what's some of the hype, because there's a ton of hype in the space as well. So why don't we just go down the panel, introduce yourself, and, and say a little bit about what your company's doing. This thing work? Can you hear me okay? All right, good. Uh, I'm Shane Dyer. I'm the founder of uh, Arant. Uh, we're one of the first and largest platform providers, uh, providing everything from the embedded software that goes inside generally consumer and light industrial products, and then operating all the cloud services that connect those products to mobile applications and increasingly back-end uh, systems for those, uh, for those companies. Um, you know, large customers of ours are guys like, Wal are guys like um, uh, Whirlpool, so they do about 70 million appliances a year and have Arant software in those appliances and then use Arant infrastructure globally to connect those devices. Uh, Osram Sylvania, the world's largest consumer lighting company, so all the Lightify products, things like that in Europe and now spreading to uh, North America and about two other geographies this year. Um, so we provide, basically, help those companies that are making that transmission, uh, transition from unconnected products to connected products make that jump. So hi, guys. Uh, I'm Adrian Caceres, I'm CTO and a co-founder of Ayla Networks. Um, Ayla is a pass for IoT, or in, in essence, the back end. And uh, our goal is to help manufacturers build connected devices and really learn. You know, we really think that um, a connected device is inherently smarter and if you can learn to build a better device, then you're going to beat at your competition. Hi, I'm Letha McLaren. I'm uh, the chief marketing officer for a company called iControl Networks. We um, have been in this space since 2002. Um, so we were doing this before it was called IoT. It was home automation back then. Uh, early on, we decided that the, the value proposition to the consumer that we could sell was uh, not direct, it was through service providers. So you would hear um, us, we're the platform behind Xfinity Homes, Security Product, ADT Pulse, Time Warner, uh, Cox Communications, Home Life. Those are all the, the um, go-to-market partners that we have that are deploying our software. Our software runs inside security panels, hubs that go inside the house, sensors that get connected to these hubs, and then the cloud architecture in the back office that pulls all that information uh, from the smart home. We have, uh, we're approaching about 3 million subscribers today, if you add all of those up, plus our international customers, and uh, that's that's what we do. Hey everybody, uh, good morning, I'm Rob Ketcher, I'm the founder and CEO of Haiku, thanks so much for uh, for having uh, me and us here. Um, and uh, so, okay, so um, Haiku was actually created to solve a uh, consumer problem. Um, that problem, if, ever, if anyone's ever gone to the grocery store and you get back and you realize you forgot something, um, what we like to call the oh crap moment, um, we created Haiku to fix that. Um, so Haiku is a shopping button. Um, it lives in your kitchen. It magnets to your fridge. You can uh, press the single button on this device and you can scan barcodes. You can talk to it. It makes a shopping list in the cloud so that uh, that list is available on my phone, my wife's phone. It's a shared shopping list. You walk in the store, you know what you need and you don't run out of stuff. Um, and we can now take that shopping list connect it to grocery stores and actively go shop for you. Um, so the value prop to the consumer is that Haiku remembers for you and shops for you. Um, we are uh, currently uh, deployed um, uh, actually around the world, both in uh, France, um, the UK, Australia, here in the US. Um, we recently announced integration with Walmart and Peapod. And uh, I'm excited to be here um, on the panel. Thanks. Very cool. So as I said, I think we've got some really, um, some really intelligent, knowledgeable, and and kind of deeply interesting folks. We were having a good conversation um, kind of in the room waiting for this to get started. So I'm going to kick off with, uh, with kind of a high-level question. And, you know, when we look at this, th there's, there's a ton of conversation going on right now saying that being hyper-connected is not really healthy for us. And so I'm going to ask the question, like, you know, how does a connected world and home benefit us? 
because we can talk about the, the obvious benefits, but is this really going to help us? Um, you know, what are the unique problems being solved in the space? And, and you know, by providing this greater connectivity, is it, is it going to benefit us? I mean, I, I love the story. Like, if I forget something, that oh crap moment, I now will remember that. Does that really help me? So anyway, <laughs> who wants to start? I think the biggest problem when we talk about, you know, technology adoption and all of a sudden we start to bring that to home is the home is a very unique beast. Um, you know, as somebody who gets all our beta products that come through, usually the ones that haven't come to market, you know, we have some stuff that kind of works a lot. And the amount of fatigue the, uh, the, you know, my overall household gets on, you know, will the lights come on this time, um, is, is, is fairly incredible. But I think that the idea that, you know, your home is this very sacred place and you don't necessarily bring in technology willy-nilly. And a lot of the things that we that are willing to do to automate in our business lives don't really apply to the home. Um, probably the biggest Grand Canyon you get is between simple control and then we talk about, oh, we're going to machine learn or we're going to connect rules engines together and really realizing that there is a huge gap between when that technology of connecting one product to another is useful and when it is the worst idea in the world and will cause your system to be uninstalled and when it actually gets to that other side where it actually is intuitive and you actually start forgetting about it and starts to disappear. And I think that we completely underestimate how large that canyon is. So what this is probably going to mean is that you know, a lot of the explosive growth right now around what we call connected home is really around you know, some of the products from some of the biggest brands that we know providing those, those uh, products that now have these connected features. You know, we have that Nest thermostat. We have that Chamberlain garage door. You know, we're just starting to get that lighting. And that's the pattern of adoption that we see the biggest growth in right now. So uh, I'll jump in. I think Shane touched on like a few what I consider really good uh, topics and points um, about um, about adoption of technology in the home. Um, I think there. I think we certainly have connectivity f uh, fatigue. There's also just kind of technology fatigue, right? Of um, I, I just a simple example, and I'm not knocking this product at all. I actually think it's a it's a very very interesting product. Um, but uh, we tried the the Amazon Echo. We brought it uh, we brought it home. Um, put it in the kitchen, and within, I'm not kidding, like, probably like seven minutes, my wife was like, get that thing out of my kitchen, right? Because <laughs> all the kids, my kids were like gathered around it, and they're like, Alexa, tell me, blah, 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 right? <laughs> it was just this, it became like this huge, like, technology distraction in the home and in the kitchen. So um, uh, 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 the, uh, I, I think the places where, um, uh, where technology uh, and, and Internet of Things can get a beachhead, a real beachhead in the home, is by just solving um, consumer problems, right? Like there are things we want to do that we can't do, right, um, unless we have a connected device. A um, couple uh, great examples, you, know, you, you touched on the control versus the, 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 the intelligence piece, right? That control of um, the fact that when I'm away, I can control my thermostat, love it. Right, love that aspect of it. Um, c being able to control your lights when you're away. Like, look at the success that um, Belkin's had with uh, with Wemo. I mean, it's just a simple switch, right? <laughs> That's all it is. But the fact that it's now connected, um, and 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 I'm out, and I can turn my lights on, I can turn my lights off, um, just for peace of mind and security reasons alone, that is huge benefit. So, so I think there are instances of just giving consumers control to solve something that they want to do that they couldn't do otherwise. So, so let me just ask a question, a following question on that. So, yeah. in the examples you just gave, I love the I love the story about Echo, by the way. So, I, I just got to say to everyone, number one thing that is asked of both Cortana and Siri directions. What's the number two thing? Tell me a joke. It's what it is, honestly. If you go look at the data, and that's just, I mean, if that's what we're using connected for, that's not too great. Um, but I, I love what you just talked about is being able to manipulate things at a distance, yeah. right? Control at a distance. So that's. That's kind of a theme that we do see. We see it at Microsoft as well. That is clearly a value statement, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So 26 million households uh, had monitored security. That I think we can all agree before like this last kind of innovation has occurred in security, it's pretty 
Uh, it, hadn't, it hadn't moved for a long, long time. And so I think with all of the technology changes that have occurred, with people being more and more mobily connected, um, it was an obvious place for us to start because 26 million households already had security. They wanted peace of mind, and it pretty much, you know, sat on their wall. People armed it once a year, and it usually, you know, 50% of the time generated a false alarm because they forgot their code. All of that changes. I mean, we have statistics that show people interact with their security system like seven times a week. Right, I mean, that's, I mean, which they used to do once a year, right? And that's an engaging, a very engaging thing. So we started there. We said peace of mind is what people want. They're willing to spend money on. We know what they'll spend money on. There's a good business model there. Um, and there's service providers that are in place that can feed on the street, they can go knock on doors and sell these products. So what do they go from there? They, uh, they start to add additional you know, value propositions on top of that. Oh, by the way, did you know that you can also connect your lights, right? And you can do the things that you can do with, but nobody was buying just the connected switch because there wasn't quite enough value proposition for that, right? Or just the connected this or just the connected that. Again, there's some corner cases of that not being true, but for generally speaking, right, people are just not buying these one-off things. They want to buy something that's offering them enough of a reason to make your life, to take that step to get you know, into the market. And then once they find that, you start to say, well, and you can also add this, and you can also add this seamlessly. Um, and I, I heard part of the last panel, and somebody said, you know, technology is moving towards it being invisible. I think that's especially true in a smart home. Um, I'll say something sacrilegious. I have an S thermostat. I love it. But my dream is that it's just a piece of sheetrock. Like, it's just, I don't, want a, I don't want a thermostat, in all honesty, right? And I like Nest, and it's great, but I just, I don't want to think about a thermostat. I just want my house to be the right temperature all the time, right? And I want it to be the right temperature when I'm away and when I'm home. Like, you shouldn't have, to, like, I think there's a peak that will, uh, is occurring to get people engaged, but it will go away, and people, people don't want to spend time having to set up their house in that manner. Can I go counterpoint? Oh, no, you go ahead. Yeah, 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 go, no, go ahead. Yeah, I go. just want to say that I, I, I'll come back. you, you, you <laughs> mentioned peace of mind, which I think is really true. So it's not just about control. Um, you know, one of our customers is this little startup called Outlet who would make this baby monitoring device. It's a little sock, and, and um, they're getting incredible amount of traction, and it's all about peace of mind because you know whether your baby is this way or that way or, you know, whether it's pulses and examiner, and it, it's amazing, you know, and, and now it's getting deployed at, at in, in hospitals. So the, the, the amount of traction is it's just a specific use case. So I don't think uh, a consumer necessarily needs to have the whole solution. They, if there's a problem that they have and there's a solution for that particular problem, they'll have space. Some of the solutions that I'm also seeing in terms of benefits is really mundane. You know, li like avoiding that second trip for getting an appliance fixed. So the person that comes already has the part on your, on, on your appliance that is broken, so you don't have to necessarily wait till noon for a 9 to 11 uh, uh, window of service, is, 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 is real value. And people are using connectivity device to, to solve those problems. So, okay, okay, I wanna come back to this, uh, you know, your comment you made, Leith, about, uh, about Nest, um, and, and you know, that you want, you just want the house to be at the perfect temperature, right? And I think we all want that, wouldn't that be great? Um, but I think that, and, and this comes back to what you were saying earlier, Shane, about, um, uh, uh, you know, just giving someone control versus like trying to layer some really heavy intelligence on top of it. Um, I'll say something really sacrilegious, and I don't really mean it, but I'll just say it anyway. Um, I hate my nest, okay? I hate it, right? I, I, I love the ability to control it remotely. I love that it's beautiful and it's super easy to adjust the temperature. Um, I love that piece, but I hate it when I, I like, I, 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 I turn the temperature down, I walk away, and it, and it turns the temperature back up, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's not saving me money, it's costing me money, it's, it's, it's messing up, I, like, just a simple thing of changing, you know, changes the temperature on me. I kind of think it's of it like... It's in the canyon of annoyance. It's, yes, <laughs> exactly. It's kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like, as, as I think about this, it's kind of like my Aunt Reba. Okay, my Aunt Reba, it's like, I tell, I, if I would tell my aunt, like, I went over to her house and like, oh, Aunt Reba, I love this brisket that you made, right? That's it, you know, she's locked in every time I come over. I might come over at, you know, n n eight in the morning, and she's like, oh, Robbie, I made you brisket. You know, I'm just like, oh, gosh, right? Like, <laughs> she's trying to, to learn my preferences, but that's really hard to do, right? Like, just, just give me the control. Um, and I'll take care of the rest. So, so, anyway. so I think that, I think some great points, and I, and I, I will just say. So I also have a nest. I also hate it, um, <laughs> but I hate I hate it for a slightly different reason. I mean, all those things are true, 
Um, I love I love the comment about you know like knowing when we're going to put some intelligence into things because if we don't put enough intelligence into it, we end up with them making things making decisions for us that clearly are, are not what we wanted. My wife is an aesthetic. She's at the point where she looks at the nest and it goes with nothing in the house. Right? I mean, I, I'm literally thinking if I can put the nest in a closet, I might be okay. But it doesn't go with anything else, right? It's a beautiful device. It was, it was, it's you know, well made. It's good looking. It's just whose house is designed like a nest, right? So, so the the idea of this technology becoming invisible or transparent or just in the background, something that's really interesting. So, so we've been we've been talking about like the, some of the challenges, right? And and we and you know we're starting to get the a theme of of where this stuff's getting applied, which is great. So. You know, Letha, you've been you've been doing this for a while, and I know this has been going on. I remember the connected home and all the other stuff that's been going on for more than a decade. Um, why? I'm just going to shorten the question. Why do we believe now is the time that some of this stuff could actually work? And we'll start with you. So again, uh, not we don't have the same business model as a lot of people who are in the space. So again, we went through service providers to solve a bunch of the things that we couldn't solve. We didn't have marketing dollars. We couldn't educate consumers. We didn't have feet on the street. We didn't think um, there was a, at, at the, again, years ago, and you could make a case that still today, um, people don't want to spend a lot of time installing stuff in their house. They don't know how. Things don't work together. You know, uh, there, it's wireless now, and it's cheaper now. So those are good things, right? And so those are things that are moving things forward. But still, people... You know, you, uh, we see failure after failure of kits sitting on shelves in Best Buy, right? Where there's this hub and a bunch of stuff, and people are like, Ugh, what do I do with that? Right? So, again, for us, we see service providers, we don't, we're not necessarily um, the long game. Um, I'm not sure service providers are, are going to, you know, own the market, but I think that there's certainly a set of people who are going to continue to want it as a service, and we think that that solves a lot of the problems that um, have existed in the market, and so that's one opportunity that we see as being successful. Now, again, will, will they take, you know, 26 million households who have security today and turn that into a you know, 100% of the, you know, population? Probably not. And again, I would argue that because the, there's a segment of people who don't want to buy it as a service. There are going to be those people who want to go and buy it from Best Buy and buy a kit. But right now, I don't think those people know that it exists. I don't think they, they know, understand the value proposition. And so I think another thing that's going to help us drive um, is awareness. And I think, you know, getting Google and Apple and Microsoft into the market to help educate the consumer around the value proposition of this technology um, and driving innovation with these, these companies that make the technology invisible, that make it all work together, that drive the standards in the right direction. I mean, I think that's, that's where we see an opportunity for some of these big guys to come in and play because eye control is probably not going to educate consumers. So, is, but is there anything from a technology or platform perspective that's come, you know, in the last 10 years that helps here? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, one of the hardest parts on around the technology is we've, we created a lot of these islands of sort of connected products that, you know, that, that kind of come together. And, you know, the problem with those islands is it was very much around, uh, you know, sets of products that had to, you know, for technical reasons, be vetted together. But it was kind of like being in an Eastern Bloc country in, like, circa 1980. You know, you had one beige choice for the various boxes and the various areas, and it probably wasn't that great a product. It just kind of worked with that system. And because it was so hard to vet, you know, what would work with what and other pieces like that, you know, the consumers never really engaged with the products themselves. And I think that, you know, the part that we're starting to see and, and we're also in some cases not seeing is, is, is the integration of the great brands. You know, the people that really make the things that we've loved for a long time. Again, I think somebody mentioned, you know, they don't sell themselves as IoT companies, but IoT is going to be absolutely central to their business. Making great products bringing them up on platforms, in many cases using, you know, platforms like Arrayance or others to, you know, take the networking part out to make it easier for them. And then from those platforms, figuring out how they're going to integrate with the various other ecosystems as they emerge. Because quite frankly, right now, there are a lot of ecosystems emerging. And so I think, you know, the ecosystems themselves won't be successful unless they have those great brands. They can't do it on beige boxes. And at the same time, the manufacturers have to have their own central IoT strategy, which includes you know, using a platform provider so that they have something they truly own to connect to the various ecosystems that are coming out there because they just don't see a shakeout anytime soon you know, with what Apple's doing, with what Google's doing, with what the service providers are putting together and others. And so I think that's really where 
you know, the change is starting to happen, and there's parts of that that are, you know, retarding us as an industry, and there are part of us that are just starting to accelerate. So, so you asked, um, you know, why has change? Why now? You know, and, and, and I think that we as consumers have changed, you know, is that um, we are with, we're just more connected, and we, for us, being connected is actually the normal. And, and that was not the case 10 years ago. Is that sad or is that good? No, I think it's good. You know, and I think, it, and I think, and we're old. So if you look at my kids, th then they're always connected. And they're very used to cloud. It, and, and that is in, it, an inherent change in terms of how we think. And for them, it's very natural. For them to, to, you know, I'm talking about an 11-year-old daughter with her smartphone used to connecting something. They, th that, that, that's what they want, that that's what they expect. So I think you're gonna see a lot of traction because of that. It's how we, how we think and, and how we're used to operate and live the rest of our lives. You know, it's not just our, you know, related to things or our home. It's how we deal with our friends, our social network, and, and everything else is very, very connected. And that is actually part of why, you know, IoT is going to happen now versus 10 years ago. And I'll add to that, too. The, one of the things that we've seen, like, our product strategy change over time from the beginning to the end is, in, you know, at the beginning we spent a lot of time um, fo focusing on solving the, the networking issues of device communication inside the home. Um, and over time, you, to the point, uh, you know, people are becoming more comfortable with cloud. Even companies are becoming more comfortable with cloud integrated devices. And so it, it's not that that problem's not going to get away. We would still like all of them to talk in the home. It would be ideal. But you, you see other, whoops. You see other ways of solving that now, and through the cloud, and, and having integrations, you know, with you know people. Everybody's got a works with program now, and you can connect things in the cloud. So I think that also helps kind of the the, the overall smart home story. Yeah, just uh, I'll just state the give a boring state the obvious answer, but uh, um, ubiquity of Wi-Fi in the home. Just speaking of connected home, right? Yeah. Ubiquity of Wi-Fi, ubiquity of broadband, um, ubiquity of smartphones um, that. Uh, you can not only grab data, throw it up to the cloud, but then that can be available anywhere you are. Um, low cost of uh, sensors, computing power. Um, yeah, I think that's all the boring answers. So th those, are all, <laughs> those are all important to bring out because those are all things that if you look at whether it's Moore's Law or whether it's the, the drop in broadband, I mean, this was never gonna work over a dial-up line, right? I mean, let's just like, can you imagine each time your sensor wanted to connect, you hear that, you know, the modem go off, uh, like that, yeah, exactly, that was not gonna work. And I, yes, I dated myself with that, and I apologize. Um, but, uh, you know, Rob, I got, I got a question for you, though, okay? So, you're, like, your whole company is, is betting on the fact that people want to be that connected, yeah. like, you know, like, damn, I forgot something, push the button, here I go. Yeah. Um, so, is there a social part of this? I'm not, so, I don't mean social in the social context, but is there a, is there, what's the human context for how you guys are thinking about your company? And, and, you know, people want to be willing to just have that ease of, okay, yeah, I forgot that. Here we go. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so um, it's a good question. So I think we're, we're super, super early, right? We, this is like, um, I, I think of this as, you know, 10 years behind mobile. So we're, you know, mobile 2000, late 2005, right? Um, so I... Uh, uh, the, the, like when you, you know, a lot of people say like, you know, people ask me and they'll say, well, you know, uh, Rob, can't people just do this with their phone, right? Can't they just make a list? Can't they do this? We actually don't view ourselves competing with a mobile app, right? We actually view ourselves competing with pen and paper, right? Um, because phys it's just super easy to physically just write something down. Now, granted, then you lose the benefits of mobile because the benefits of mobile are that you have your list with you when you walk in the store, you can share it with others. So um, th there's, uh, 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 then you kind of couple in the uh, uh, purchasing of groceries online. Like here in the U.S., purchasing of groceries online, you hear all this hype, and, and all in the news, you know, Instacart this and Amazon that, it's still like less than 2.5% of all consumer packaged goods are purchased online, right? So this is early, early days. So... Um, you know, I think when you're when you're kind of pioneering into that into those new markets early, um, th th there there's definitely will be a a uh, a component of consumers, not necessarily just people in this room, but mass market consumers just becoming aware. You know, Lee, you you touched on this of just you know people don't even know that they could do this yet, right? So there there there's uh, there's definitely an awareness problem, right? Uh, th th that that 
I think that's part of the social piece that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, a, a great example of that is there's a number of these applications that, you know, are really difficult to educate. But then as soon as you have someone that uses them, they're incredibly hard to take back away. So you know they've got a real value proposition. I mean, lighting's a good one. We work with Osram Sylvania for, for their uh, Lightify programs. You know, if you just think about, you know, what you do at night and how you walk around with your little finger in your house and become a light switch farmer. And if you have kids, the, you know, the problem is compounded. So that's, you know, just one easy one that we understand. But the ones that we don't understand yet are, you know, the ability to sort of start to change color of, you know, you know, how warm or how cool or what shade or what hue and how that affects the entire room and space. I mean, all the impressionist painters in the world taught us how important light was, and now we have the ability to bring some of those aspects to our house, and we don't even understand it yet, and we've never had control on that access before. It's been bright or dark, but whatever the bulb happens to be. And so I think, you know, as the, we start to sort of understand these applications, it will become sort of a no-brainer, we won't give them up, but that doesn't overcome how big the, you know, the education hurdle is to get there and how many, you know, fumbles on making the technology hard or slow or difficult to install will, you know, can, can inhibit us by, you know, five or ten years in many cases in terms of this adoption pattern. But it's still going to happen. Uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I, I just got to say, so there was a very famous old quote. Um, somebody was uh, talking about Thomas Edison about 40 years after he invented, you know, the light bulb. And, and the story was great, now we're gonna be painting the world in monochrome, right? And so that's exactly the point, right? We, we, I, I love that, that story because um, what you just drew is we now have the ability to, to paint our, our living spaces with variable, variable colors and hues, and, and I don't think we have any idea. I, I'm thinking in my own house, like it's, it's flat white yeah, it's and that's it. It's science fiction right now, yeah, right? right? Yeah. That's right. Okay. Um, so let's let's show. I, I got to touch on this. Um, we've touched on it a little bit. I don't know if there's going to be a lot more to talk about. I want to make sure we bring it up. Um, we've talked about some of these vectors that are causing this change, which is really good. Uh, I just wanted to kind of get your opinion, and it can be an and, but like so. We've talked about security. That's clearly a driver here. Um, we've talked about productivity. That's clearly a driver, and convenience is a driver. I, in your worlds, is is there any one of those that's kind of leading more than the others, or is it just going to be an and, and all three of them are going to kind of be important, or is there another one out there that's really helping as well? I mean, one of the ones is if you can drive safety like that, that, you know, we have this, we mentioned them before, the emotional connection to our home, um, the idea that that is a very special, almost sacred place to us, and that our need to keep that safe or understand if our garage door is open or turn our lights on and off while we're away so we, you know, it looks like we're still there and no one will break in. Things like this are, you know, uh, you know, tend to resonate and tend to be able to, you know, you know, if you hit those fear patterns, that, that seems to, to, um, um, to move product, you know, across the products we've gone through. So that's been a big one. I think, the, I think the convenience, the number of things that we do that are not automated in our lives, if it can be done well, I mean, we talked about how difficult that is to do. Um, so not underestimating that, but, but you know, the, the, the amount of time that we lose in little everyday things that we wouldn't have to lose and the number of mistakes we make um, as we go through that. Um, those are two areas that seem to be fertile dirt in terms of like how our products that are on our platform are selling. So uh, peace of mind, which covers safety and security in our mind, but um, the one we didn't talk about was, uh, you know, savings, uh, dollar savings, yeah. right? And so we do see some opportunity for that. It, sometimes people call it, you know, energy management. You can pay less for your energy bills. Sometimes it's maintenance, right? You can, um, you know, have no things that are going bad inside your house before they actually go bad and, and, and you know, save yourself money that way. Um, so there's, you know, it's much smaller than peace of mind that's driving sales, but it's, it's still interesting. I think um, it's maybe not being exploited as much as it could be, but I think green, you know, kind of the, the people want to do that, right? They, they want to be greener, but uh, they, sometimes they don't always know how, right? And, and they're, never, they're not always told that, yes, you're being green, right? So um, I, I think Nest did play into that. They played into that some, you know, uh, save some energy, right? Save the planet, get the little leaf, right? Oh, cool, I got a leaf, you know, good for me, right? <laughs> So uh, I think that could be a factor too. So, so um, something that I have seen, uh, especially this year, you know, compared to, to the years before, is that my first customers came came to me asking for kind of like a remote control, you know, you know, really wanting this convenience or, or basically having an app to control monitor whatever the device is. Um, 
today I'm seeing a lot of my customers more sending way more data to the cloud than, than ever before. It, it's, it's been a, this year has been really interesting that even though there's still that convenience or the remote control aspect to it, it's probably about 10% uh, or less uh, that is really, in terms of the amount of data being sent, uh, that is actually tied to a user. They're sending way more data about how device, a lot of it has to do with the, with the niche where, where Ayla plays, which is, tends to be like fairly high value kind of devices, you know, appliances, furnaces kind of thing. Um, but, it's, but it's really been interesting how, how recently um, that trend has happened. We have, we have customers who, who uh, actually are not that interested in, in, in providing the consumer with, with, with an app. They, they just really just want that data. That, that, that's really interesting. Um, you know, there are a bunch of things. I, I love the fact that we, you know, we, we brought up some, you know, that this is early, that there's, it's more than convenience, the safety and security piece is a key piece to it. Um, I, I, I gotta go back to the light switch farming. I, I, I think that may stick with me forever because that was a good one, I like that. I do, I, I do it every night, so. <laughs> um, so. So I wanna, before we open this up to questions to the, from the audience, I, I, there's one that we have to touch on and it's security. And we can talk about the security, the systems that we're installing, the security, the data that we're, we're, that we're passing up and down through cloud. Um, you know, both on the app side and it's on the cloud side. So when you guys think about the space you're in and the products that you guys are putting forward, um, how are you thinking about security and from the standpoint of both the end user security and the systems? Well, I mean, the, the biggest piece is you, you got some of the biggest brands in the world riding on you, right? If they, if they have a brand trust break, it doesn't matter how big that is, First of all, we're so tuned into IoT news right now, that thing's gonna go up immediately and hit New York Times, you know, I mean, not just tech publications, but mainstream publications on that to go through. So the stakes are incredibly high. And then the second part is, you can't layer it on. You can't have a product that's designed and then you go, oh, we're gonna put a layer of security on top of it, right? I mean, you know, those things are butter for hackers. You know, you can get right through. I mean, if it isn't anticipated at the very moment you put a pen to a paper, you know, to start thinking about how the system was architected, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. And I think one of the biggest problems are a lot of the manufacturers aren't experts in this. You know, they're not, they don't have, you know, um, you, know, you know, security experts on staff that know about this kind of security. If they do, they come from the IT side, and it's very different when you're talking about, you know, a, a washing machine or a dryer or something like that that could do some, in hor you know, horrible things if it was fully compromised. Um, and that kind of IoT security versus what, you, you know, when you, what you'd see in like an IT environment. So I think you know, the ones that are getting in trouble, a lot of them are sort of doing it themselves and trying to create, you know, reinvent the wheel on that platform. That's a bad idea. You know, I think you know, finding somebody that's done this before is really important. And the ones that aren't really anticipating what security is going to mean for their entire program beforehand. There's a lot of fails on the other side too where you know, they, you know, for security reasons they create unusable products or uninstallable products. You know, it's like, wait, we got security on this and we've got a 35% return rate because no one can figure out how to install it. But man, we got it secure. So it's a harder problem than most people think and it, it almost has to be in your DNA from, from day one in order to be able to get it right. One of the things that I, that I see is, um, is that IoT is, is gonna be a little bit different because it's, there's more than one thing involved. You know, that's when how we, we're not gonna want an app that controls only one device. We're gonna want an app that controls many devices. And there's gonna be multiple systems that, that, are, that are basically like touching the data. So, so data governance is gonna play a really, really big role um, in, in, in how we're sharing that data. It, it, is, it, is, it is amazing how unaware people really are uh, about data governance and, and, and basically data privacy. You know, in, in the states, it's a mess. You know, I don't know how many people know, but every single state in the United States has a different data privacy law. Um, and, and I have to conform with all, with all of them. You know? and, and as you go global, it becomes even, even messier. Um, but we're sharing data. So uh, you know, what happens if, if when, when I shared some of the data with another service, uh, and, and what happens if they get a breach? Uh, you know, you know, Europe is about to pass a law in, in its most where, where everybody's liable in, in the chain. So that, to me, is going to be a, it's an area of security where, where we haven't really even broached it, but it's, but it's a big it's kind of the iceberg that, 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 that is coming. So I think data sovereignty will probably play a role there too, right? So clearly. Yeah, and I agree with everything. I know you wanted it to be controversial, but I ha this one's hard to be controversial on. Um, we, uh, yep, 
you have to build it from the beginning. I agree with that. From every technology decision that you made, down to the protocols of devices communicating to each other, all the way up to the cloud, all the you know path of where the data goes. Um, we spend a ton of time on that. I mean, obviously, we're a security company. We deliver you know the security for ADT Pulse, and so there's video in there. There's a lot of you know vi occupancy data, a lot of information that is extremely critical. That it is both secure and private. And so um, we spend a ton of time on that, and um, I can't stress enough, like building it from the beginning, because you know um, we, we start to talk with people. You know, cloud integrations with other devices are great, and it makes it easier. Um, but then, to your point, you kind of take on some of the responsibility of, of security decisions that other people have been making, right? And so, have you know, fixing that so that people feel comfortable integrating their Nest thermostat with your smart home. Um, it's just another, you know, aspect of security that wasn't even within our control when you know we built our security stack. So, so I just add it, it is it is additive, right? If if you're talking about Internet of Things, like you all, it's not it's meaning it's not something completely brand new. Right, like you, you already have to worry about security, right? If you're a, a company like ours, so you know we're a connected device company. So we have a cloud service, we have mobile apps, we have SDKs, we have APIs, and we also have a piece of hardware, right? Um, so getting that data from the edge of the network is the part that's new. Getting it from the edge of the network up to your up to your cloud. So um, for for us. We actually, I don't want to say we didn't want to worry about security. We didn't want to have to build all that stuff ourselves, which is one of the reasons we partnered with, you know, Plug Coming. Um, we partnered with Electric Imp, right? Because uh, that was part of their offering um, that they provide. You know, we plunk their chip down, and it's connectivity as a service. Like I know that data gets to gets to our cloud. It was just a piece that we didn't have to have to necessarily build or worry about ourselves. So I think there are, um, you know, there are. Uh, partners out there that are focused on on that piece, getting that data from the edge of the network up to the cloud, but then you still have all your your normal security problems, <laughs> right? Which is your servers could get hacked, and you know, uh, make sure you're using security protocols, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's there's two big schools of thought on that too when you talk about the edge, and I think there's a number of companies and things that go, you know, the edge is very important, and we've got to bring a lot of complexity to that edge in order so that we have the horsepower and the pieces to be able to address the security uh, concerns with, uh, with uh, you know, techniques that have been pioneered in IT and brought down to these devices. And I almost think that it's the, exactly the wrong way to go. We create these really big, really complicated systems at the edge that we have no prayer of being able to secure. Um, you know, I mean, you, th you talk about, you know, making just a decision on I'm going to run Linux in my, you know, on my, on my device, right? Well, what does that open up to? The, you know, what does that open you up to? You've got hundreds of thousands of lines of code that have nothing to do with IoT that you're now responsible for maintaining and making sure there aren't holes in them and patching them as you go through. And I think, you know, when we talk to our clients and we have discussions about it, we really try to figure out, you know, how can you get the right interlocks in that product? How can you make sure that that product, in many ways, is set up to do what it does really, really well, and you don't have a lot of peripheral code or peripheral, you know, capabilities there that are going to cause you more trouble than they're going to, than, than they're going to solve. So that sort of thick client, thin client, as it applies to security, is going to be a huge debate at the edge. And I think we very much gravitate towards thinking about those, uh, you know, how those clients can be can be extremely efficient, uh, reliable, and secure. And they, they don't have a lot of extra stuff on them that will be liabilities later on. I think it's really interesting in talking about the home specifically because um, we're going to want flexibility, right? It, it, creating the most secure system in the world if we can't have the flexibility of being able to add in the things that we want, and I'll give you an example. So there's a, I'm going to call it a commune. That's not what it is. It's actually a set of houses in Arizona where they've decided to do communal, communal energy farming. And they're setting up a solar array in a shared backyard and sharing that electricity. And I, when I heard this, I was like, that is awesome. We should all do that if we all have space, right? Um, and then I thought about it. How do they split up who gets what? And could one of them farm a little more at the expense of somebody else, right? So that flexibility, being able to say, hey, you know, we're all going to get the same amount or we'll do it by square footage or a number of people in the house or, you know, that kind of thing. It's, there's some interesting stuff going on there, clearly. Denise, do we have time to take a couple questions from the audience? Okay, so just a couple of questions we want to see. We've got one, one in the back. Uh, 
I think that's a really good question. You know, I think, uh, you know, we came at this from the part that, you know, the future is already here, it's just not well distributed. Is that a Gibson quote or something? I, don't, I probably got that wrong, right? Um, so, you know, if you're a Silicon Valley startup, the great part is you've got all these great, crazy investors and venture capitalists. So, you, you know, you, you, you take the Whirlpool guys and the other manufacturing guys and you trot up to their home where they spent $250,000 you know, on their home automation system. And you say, what do you like about it and what do you love about it? And a lot of this comes down to your question, which is where you put the, you know, where you put the complexity. And what we're finding now is that the very high-end home guys that are going in, in many cases now, are starting to split off and not have that central kind of you know, uh, you know, AMZ, AMD system or other systems that are out there brain, but really splitting it into separate functions, one for gate and one for lighting and finding the best of breed in each of those places. And there's no central brain. Mainly because they don't want to have, you know, Chip or Dave or Judy, who's the programmer for that thing, have to be sold along with the house. You know, the amount of complexity that was put in terms of, 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 of you know, having that sort of server or that big master hub turned out to be the wrong place to put complexity, even if you had, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to spend. So I think the, the pendulum may be swinging a little bit more towards, you know, best of breed in separate ways rather than having overall control and then very thoughtfully thinking about how to connect these things together. And it's possible that we've put too much emphasis on, you know, overwide, you know, my lighting system talking to my garage door or my door lock or this other piece there, when that's a really, really hard problem and in many cases may cause us, you know, some more harm than good. So that's just one perspective on, you know, what, you know, what, well, you know, what the, well, you know, what the, but where that pendulum may be swinging. I disagree. <laughs> so I, I think uh, I think um, the exciting thing is that all of these data, all of these devices that are connected, have a lot of data, and you get the, all of that to the cloud, and you start to make really smart decisions. I'm not sure that iControl will be the one that offers that. I'm not sure, you know, Comcast will. I think that p perhaps it will be decoupled, and they'll, it's an opportunity for really smart people to figure out business models that can make that work. And I I would buy it. I don't I. I would purchase as a consumer something that was really smart and learned from my behavior of my home and tied that all together because I don't want just the smartest light system and I don't want just the smartest garage door opener, right? I need them to be able to talk to each other so that my whole home, right, can behave the, the way that I want it to behave. Again, who solves the problem? I'm not exactly sure who's going to solve it, but I think the exciting thing is, you know, all of the data is coming from these homes. I mean, Again, you could argue the reason the Nest thermostat doesn't do what you want is because they don't have enough sensors to actually be able to know when your home is occupied or not, right? And I know they're solving some of that stuff by coming out with other devices, but I mean, with more devices coming in sensors and actuators and all that thing, all connected devices inside your house, I think that all together makes a really, really compelling opportunity for somebody to solve that problem. Just, re just, re just super quick. I mean, I think there's tons of examples of intelligence um, in the cloud that we love, right? Like I love recommendations, whether it's um, you know Netflix or you know like what restaurant to eat at, what movie to watch, um, et cetera. Um, my, I, I envision those types of intelligence being super helpful inside the home. I can, you know, w without getting into specific examples, but uh, um, uh, more that than you know grabbing the steering wheel from you and. And, you know, talking about cars, <laughs> but grabbing the steering wheel from you and doing something in your house. Uh, more, he, here's something we've we've learned and we recommend. So, last question. Just about every IoT that has a chip is going to run Linux. How can we make Linux more secure? Don't do it. <laughs> He's always the Neanderthal. <laughs> no, I think I think that. Um, I think that you know what's retarded IoT in some ways is not is, is not is is the fact that we haven't dramatically rethought a lot of the technology that we've done in I in, in, you know in the uh, in the cloud or in the server farm or in the enterprise and we sort of brought it a little bit blindly down. So I mean that's a that's a flippant response to you. I think it can be done. I just think that you have to work very very carefully on figuring out how to put the right secure subset for the right application in that place. And I think that overall it can be done. It's just a company that, that, that goes through and puts a lot of complexity in the product needs to understand what it's going to take to be able to manage that complexity going forward. I mean, a good example, we brought up Nest before. I mean, those guys had a heck of a time, you know, figuring out how to manage their firmware updates and how to figure out how to manage the security aspects on that because they put a full-blown computer into your wall for a thermostat. Um, that 
you know that that decision came with a lot of you know, you know with all you know came with a lot of expense and baggage as well, as well as providing some flexibility. So I think, I, I think you know to, you know to your point, it's really going to take a very thoughtful approach to figure out what's going to make sense at the edge, how much processing there's going to be at the edge, how much you know how much the you know, the machine learning and the other pieces we're going to put there in order to get that right. What about the other panelists? Yeah, well, I, what I, I uh, so I have customers that, that run Linux on their devices. Y you know, and, and I guess the, uh, the answer that I will tell you is that do not store any PII on your device, okay? So assume that the device will get compromised. And if you're able to have a modern architecture where you're not storing any PII, then, then you should be fine because you are containing. It's like an onion, right? So, so you will make it as secure as you can, but you're also containing and limiting your exposure in case it does get compromised. Okay, guys, I want to thank you all. Thank the panelists for a great panel. I think it was really interesting. Thank you, guys. Hope you enjoy the rest of the day.